Hey guys, I have here a 12 volt, 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery from Litime. This is their base, regular version, whatever you want to call it. It's the cheapest 100 amp hour they sell. I purchased this myself. This is not a sponsored video uh, for an upcoming test I'm going to do. But what fun would it be buying a battery if we didn't get to tear it apart and see what's actually inside of it? Additionally, I reviewed their smart version a while back and recently I've been receiving some questions as to what the differences are. And the core difference is going to be the BMS used in both of the batteries. This base version does not have low temperature charging protection. Other than that, it should be pretty much the same quality we expect from lit time, which is formerly known as ampere time. So this video is pretty much just to tear the battery apart and see what's inside of it. We're not going to run through a full review. We're not going to do capacity testing or anything like that. And then we're going to spend a few minutes at the end talking about my engine, since some of you did express interest in that in the last video, which was over a month ago now. I really need to get back to it and uh, this is a great way to start. These batteries do seem to be getting cheaper and cheaper as we go on here. This one is currently $259 with free shipping on their website. And down in the video description, you'll find a link to their website that actually applies a discount code to your cart. I think it's 5% off. I'll have to double check on that, um, but there is an exclusive code if you use that link. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and tear it apart. I always wear eye protection. Yeah, all right, and there is our BMS. So for cabling, the negative is three number 10 gauge silicone insulated wires. The positive is a six gauge silicone insulated conductor. You can see all the ring terminals are tight. I've checked. The positive is kind of bent at an angle here the way they installed it. The negative conductors are soldered to the BMS. We have our balance leads coming off and the connector is held in with some silicone or some sort of adhesive here. Thermal switch here for high temperature protection. There is no temperature sensor anywhere that I could see because remember this battery does not have low temperature protection. The BMS is held onto the battery pack here on the side. Not too much in the way of thermal protection or thermal isolation and that's kind of a rather small heat sink there but and that's kind of a hint of what we're going to be testing in an upcoming video but that's not the focus of this particular video. Let's see if we can pull this battery out. I need a glove so I don't hurt my hand. I think it is glued in there, which is mildly annoying. Right, it is moving, but I think I did break some of the plastic mount, unfortunately. Oh my gosh, that is by far the most difficult battery I've had to disassemble. And all of that because the straps down here are glued to the bottom of the case. I can't really think of any other battery that I've had this much trouble getting out of the actual plastic case. And unfortunately, I've completely destroyed it. So, you know, I'm gonna have to buy another one for the test I actually wanted to run in the first place. Oh well. All right, so there is the part of the battery that was in the bottom of the case. You can see where all that adhesive glue was on these straps. And then all that was glued to the bottom of this plastic case. I don't know what kind of glue they use, but man, it does not come back off. All right, so here is the battery pack. There's a piece of foam on the top. It is not obstructing the vents, which is good to see. See if we can get that off here. And here's a look at the top of the battery pack. We do have aluminum bus bars, laser welded in place. Uh, laser welds look good as usual. I haven't really seen any batteries that are laser welded that are done inadequately. Um, every laser weld I've seen has been done pretty well. So we've got some threaded holes here for the balance leads to screw in. These are GFB cells. They are model number 0ALCBA3510000D. Then for the main positive and negative here, we have a small angle piece of aluminum welded on, and there's a nut plate in the back there to catch the bolt. The cells do have plastic spacing them apart. That's about it to see on this battery. I was hoping to put it back together so I can do some high rate discharge testing here. Not going to happen here. So I'm gonna go ahead and get another one of these batteries ordered. And lit time, formerly known as Ampere Time, has become one of the top choices. Uh, it's one of the best selling, at least through my channel. And it is my recommended battery for purchase when someone says, hey, I need a cheap 12 volt, 100 amp hour battery. I haven't heard any problems that I can think of off the top of my head with these batteries. If any of you guys own a lid time battery, I'd love to know how your experience has been. Have you had any problems? Is it still working well? How long have you had it? Leave that down in the comment section down below. Don't forget to hit that like button and let's take a look at the engine. This is a 1998 Toyota Corolla. I've had it for over 15 years now and it's got 230,000 miles on it. 
It features a 1ZZ FE engine with a 4-speed automatic transmission. It was the first year for the 1ZZ engine, and it's the only complete year that did not have variable valve timing. VVT was added in mid-1999 and used from that point forward. This car might not have a lot of value looking at Kelly Blue Book, but it's got a lot of personal value to me, and uh, it's become a very fun and enjoyable project for me to continue working on to keep it maintained and to keep rebuilding and cleaning it up. Most recently, as I noted in a past video, the engine has been idling very rough and some of you guys threw out some ideas there didn't expect so many people to actually be interested in the engine and at the point i said that i pretty much tested or replaced every component possibly serviceable so about a month ago i decided to pull the engine and do a complete rebuild on it now this isn't the first time i've done some work on this engine i had the head removed about five or six years ago now um, and I replaced the piston rings at that time. There was a, a defect or rather a, a lack of good design in the early version of the 1ZZ where the oil drain holes were a bit smaller than they should have been in the pistons. And those could get clogged up causing it to have some excessive oil burning. Now, when I half rebuilt this about six years ago, I was burning through about a quart of oil per month, which is just ridiculous. Redid the piston rings and added some additional drain holes. It's been running perfectly since then. Up until about, you know, about a year ago, it's been starting to slowly have this incrementing rough idle issue. So the entire engine has been disassembled and I haven't really taken any video of that because I didn't plan on making videos of it. However, two big things I noted from that were that the gap in the two compression rings of the pistons were lined up and they should not have been. Now, when I put them in the first time, I did not line them up. However, I don't think that I followed the best break-in protocol to have those rings seated where they should have been. Uh, I remember when I started up for the first time, I left it idle for probably 20, 30 minutes, and I understand now you're not supposed to do that. And the other thing I noticed is that when I removed the crankshaft position sensor, there was a whole pile of debris stuck to it. Uh, it did appear to be magnetic, however, I don't see anywhere where metal shavings have scraped off. So I can't really explain that one, but I do think it may have been interfering with the crankshaft position sensor. So here's where I'm at currently. This is the block. I've got the bearing cap put back on. It does have new main bearings. I've cleaned it up quite a bit. I did not do any machining work. I don't plan to do any machining work. However, I'm checking the tolerances of pretty much everything I can. I do have the original factory repair manual here, which does give all those tolerances and installation and disassembly procedures. Uh, you probably can't see it on video, but I've got the cylinders honed. I actually honed each one twice. I've got a perfectly nice cross pattern in there. Uh, there are still a few dark spots left. However, they don't look overly bad. I did check the ring gap and it is slightly out of tolerance. It's not too bad. It's just like at the tail end of what the standard range was. Finishing up work on the head here, I got the exhaust valves in. There's the lifter buckets for the exhaust side and there's all of the intake components. Uh, I've got all of the old valve seals there and then the bearing caps for the cams. And you can see the valves here, I've cleaned them up pretty good with a wire brush on the bench grinder. You know, they're a little worn, but given they have 230,000 miles on them, I think they're pretty darn good. All of the components removed are lined up down here. I've cleaned most of them at this point, still have to work on some of them. You can see I've got my hardware bagged and labeled so I don't mix any of it up. Pretty much all of the hoses are getting replaced. I purchase Toyota parts wherever I can. However, uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult to get a hold of parts for a car so old. So there's the valve cover and the head that's ready to go back on. I've got my cams here. One thing I did notice is that uh, this journal here on the exhaust cam, you can see it's got a little bit of a scratch on. It's not too deep, but I can feel it if I rub my finger over it. I don't think there's any point in replacing that unless I'm going to replace the entire head. And at this point, I don't want to invest that much into it. I'll be using this Lucas engine break-in oil for the first run. Didn't use break-in oil the first time around, and I think it's going to help quite a bit with getting those piston rings seated where they need to be. I was able to get a lot of stuff from the Toyota deal. I was surprising. So I got new radiator hoses. I've got new cam sprockets. It's all new timing. I've got a new genuine timing chain here. So I've insisted on genuine Toyota for all the timing components. I'm not using any aftermarket timing. The pistons cleaned up very, very well. I didn't want to scrub them too much, so there is a little bit of brown still on them. But the most important parts here, the seating area of the rings and the top of the piston is clean. So at this point, I'm just waiting for the new connecting rod bearings. And here's a look at the timing side. I've got a bit of gasket to scrape off yet, but overall, I think it came out very well for an engine of this age and considering it was not professionally cleaned. And here's just a quick look at the engine bay. I've cleaned off the transmission down there. New motor mounts, as you can see. I've got a new axle since the old axle was leaking grease. I've cleaned the power steering reservoir and I've got all new hoses for the power steering since some of those were cracked. I'll probably reuse those two coolant hoses for the heater as they look to be in good shape. Almost everything else in here is in good shape. 
Uh, I've maintained and serviced this car very well in the 15 years I have owned it. So yeah, any questions or comments, you can leave those as usual. I do love reading through them and seeing what you guys think. If you wanna purchase a lid time battery, there is a link down in the video description. Please hit that like button before you go and thanks for watching.